Welcome everybody. My name is Dave Gordon, Executive Director of the National Sports Media Association. I want to thank Greater Winston-Salem Inc. for sponsoring our weekly or semi-weekly or mostly weekly but not every week uh, continuing education series. We're uh, happy to have and, and very proud to have one of our Hall of Famers today, Gary Smith, longtime Sports Illustrated feature writer. Is that book done, by the way, Gary, that we talked about? Three years ago yet? Uh, you know, it is, I hope it's getting <laughs> dang close, but I've been wrong before, so I will not go too far. Well, and thank you, and uh, thank you, and, and welcome, and uh, appreciate uh, your time today, and uh, thank you for being clean for us. It's oh, man, it's so we wet always... hair, didn't even get to try that, so it's just a much shambles as you're going to ever want to see here. Well, that's okay. Well, we'll in, in editing, we'll clean it up. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, what I usually do uh, with all our guests is have you, rather than me go rote through your bio, is have you tell your path to how you got where you are today, and I'll, I'll let you wander on that path now. I'll try to cut to the chase as much as possible. Um, when I was 16, my um, sister was had won the Junior Miss Pageant of Delaware, and the following year she was uh, the judge of this pageant. Um, and um, so my mom was there and this, one of the other judges was this sports editor of the Wilmington Delaware News Journal. So as soon as this was over, my mom cornered this sports editor and said, Who, uh, my son is interested in writing, loves sports. Do you have any thoughts on what he should do or you know, when suggestions? And he said, well, I'm leaving for Clearwater to cover the Phillies in spring training in two days. If he gets his tail into my office, who knows? Well, you know, I'll talk to him and we'll see. So I got in there, got a job just doing the you know smallest things you could possibly do and running coffee, taking little league scores, bowling scores, you name it, over the phone. And um, just started working there a uh, couple days a week, at full day, full time in the summer, doing you know small fry stuff. And then from there, after a couple of years of doing that, the sports, assistant sports editor there went to the Philadelphia Daily News which at that time in the 70s was one of the, maybe the best sports department in America. So it was just great, good fortune, very creative approach to sports writing and encouraged uh, their people to push the envelope. And so after a couple years of doing that, um, they offered me the Eagles beat and I did that for a couple years. And then uh, the editor of a magazine called Inside Sports, which is a literary sports magazine that Newsweek was funding at the time, saw my stuff, came down to the sh Jersey Shore on weekends and happened to see my stuff in the Daily News, offered me a job at Inside Sports. So I then got to learn about magazine writing, which was another genre in itself. And, um, you know, I had a great, you know, I had a real learning curve there, um, but I had maybe the best magazine editor who ever lived. Again, great fortune fell into my lap, was a man named Jay Lovinger. So he really uh, introduced me to what the difference is, is between, you know, at first you just think a news, a magazine story is a longer newspaper story is kind of how, when you first walk into it. And uh, I was, you know, no, learned otherwise uh, pretty quickly. And uh, so that's, you know, he was a guy that went, but went, you know, got under the engine, under the hood of what a, a piece could be and the possibilities to explore just opened up a lot of w windows and doors in my mind. and. Um, after three years there, uh, Newsweek pulled the plug financially on the startup of Inside Sports, which was a monthly sports magazine, kind of a literary sports magazine. And uh, SI had been offering me to come over there. And so uh, what I did was rather than going as a staff writer, um, which they offered, I said, can I just go on and write four stories a year as a special contributor, um, which, you know, gave me the opportunity and possibility to travel a lot and think a lot and really have a lot of time to spend on those four stories for roughly half the price, the, uh, half the income they were offering to do go on as a staff writer. I was at that point in my life, I was able to make that trade off. And uh, that was maybe the best decision I ever made in my life, uh, work, work life. And, um, so would, you know, go on a story and then maybe spend an extra month traveling in that country if it was in another country or just gave me time to go deep on the stories, spend a lot of time with the subjects and interviewing and researching and thinking about a piece. 
because I wasn't just turning the wheel and going on to the next piece and the next piece. And um, so that, um, so that's what I did. Uh, worked, did four stories a year. They gave me, which gave me two to three months per piece theoretically, but you know, I sometimes got them done a little faster than that. And we just spend that time reading, traveling, did that for a number of years. And then finally they offered me to go on staff but keep the same deal. That was my, you know, what I, the main thing I wanted to insist on was just do four a year. And uh, sometimes I would do some side stuff, freelance on the side for other publications. But so that was my gig. And it was, I still think it may be the best gig of anybody I've ever heard of in journalism. I caught the wave at the sweet spot for magazines. I uh, feel for people who are not on that sweet spot, didn't catch that wave, but I, I happened to. And so, I mean, you realize that every other sports writer in the world hates your guts because you were able to work that four-story deal, right? I deserve it. <laughs> Their hatred. And, um, and so, yeah, and I did that up until a few years back and, uh, you know, finally moseyed on down the road. But the road was shriveling up <laughs> as, we were, as I was moseying down it. So uh, I, I probably got out at the right time, too. I don't know. Who knows? And other than working on a book, what are you? What have you been up to? Um, you know, I'm working on about three different nonprofits, trying to do something about climate crisis, uh, gun reform, and um, teaching children mindfulness in schools. Nice. So let, let's go back to uh, I think the the phrase that uh, kind of stood out to me was "push the envelope." Um, had, had that always been your nature or was it something that somebody yeah. said to you <laughs> and it yeah my, my wife will probably tell you that that's been my name <laughs> um, but um, but uh, having the you know proper support and encouragement for that to like not just write a story to just to cover your bases and your x y a b c it is it's coming out of those boundaries and thinking larger and seeing, you know, if you could say more about the human condition and do it creatively and play with words and play with structure. Um, for a newspaper, the daily news at that time was, you know, you know, among the, there were very select few or almost on its own. And as far as the, the talent and the encouragement of that talent to write, you know, to go out there and take chances. Um, and then inside sports was even more so. So I was in a breeding ground twice for that kind of thinking. I mean, inside sports was hiring some of the best writers in America and would have them do something that had to do with sports. And sometimes it was so thin of a line, the connection with sports that, um, it, you know, it took it to the brink. Um, writers who became like national bookseller, you know, some best writers in America, like Pete Dexter, if you're familiar with him, was writing, they would hire those kind of writers. And so I was the only staff writer for Inside Sports, which was interesting to be the one staff writer, um, but just surrounded by people and that, the conversations and about going out there and trying different things in a piece um, was just a breeding ground for it. So very fortunate by the time I came to SI, which, you know, you know, gave you the time and space to try some different things, but it, it was just more, it's more of an establishment kind of place. Um, so, you know, that, that, that wasn't in the air at every moment at SI, but the two places I'd been in before it was. So I, by the time I got there, I had enough of that in my, you know, background and training. But, but one, just to go back to your question, I am the kind of person who, given that possibility, I will uh, do that. I mean, I, you know, just crazy stuff I, I like doing. It's kind of weird, and you know, so I push uh, now, that nature. So now, for those of us who were who were fortunate enough to be in attendance when you went into the NSMA Hall of Fame, we could vouch. I'll I'll put it up here and uh, share the screen. <laughs> um, you sang. I, I, I'm guessing you are the only inductee to this day who who sang. Came up with a, a semi-original song, original lyrics for your induction. Uh, yeah. Where did that, that come from? 
that was a David Byrne song, Talking Heads right. song. But, uh, but, but if you remember the earlier one where I, I was presenting for Rick Riley, where we had my whole family come up and, uh, were you there for that, Dave? I was not. Okay, well, we hijacked Rick Riley and uh, my sisters, who were, you know, we created this whole scenario where we came up on stage, uh, totally unbeknownst to him when I was presenting him and my siblings all happened to be in North Carolina for other reasons. It was crazy because they live all over the place. But they'd taken my mom there for like her 80th birthday or something. And so they were all there. And so they, we hijacked Rick Riley. He was getting his ninth, you know, <laughs> writer of the year award. And my siblings, you know, my siblings discussed with me for never winning the award. They, they, were, they took him up and we hogtied him like it, uh, <laughs> it was the, in the news at the time was the uh, it was Abu Ghraib, I think it's called or whatever in Iraq where American were in trouble for what they'd done to people <laughs> over there in this prison to get information out of them. So they, we did the same thing. We put a black hood on Rick and made him either turn the thing over to me or the, the midstream, like with the, the twist on it was, my sister suddenly had this brilliant idea. She's an actress, so she was brilliant in her presentation of why don't we just, if you'll change the name of your column to Life of Smitty instead of Life of Riley, we'll adopt you into our family and now we will have <laughs> all these awards in our family instead of Gary blowing it every year and losing to Rick for Sports Writer of the Year. So. That was the whole gist of that. So it was another absurd moment in NMSA uh, history there. And, and anyway, speaking of which, we, we, we also had another, I think it was that year, maybe the year before we went to, uh, for years they had given a, a, a Hall of Fame plaque made of Salisbury pink granite, which when I came on board found didn't etch very well. And uh, I think 2011 was the last year we did it maybe. and. All I remember was Brent Musburger's Hall of Fame plaque looked like a, a cartoon. So we switched to black granite, and a lot of people think that it looked more like a headstone, which you put to good use right after you won the award, <laughs> as everybody sees right there. Yeah, sorry about that. That's <laughs> I have a sense of humor. I'm good with that. Okay. Because <laughs> we, we actually made that comment the first year we did it. So it kind of looked like a headstone. But anyway. Um, Let's go back. Uh, another word you mentioned. Hey, Mike. I see Mike there. How's it going, Mike? Great to Hi, see Mike. you. Hi, Mike. I haven't seen Mike in forever Mike either. Jeff McGregor, another name. I don't see his face, but I see his uh, shadow. Uh, so uh, two people I and uh, kind of know, and I feel like David Hale is a name I know, and yeah. a couple other. Ethan. Yeah, there's a couple names here I feel like I know. But anyway, good to see you all. All good people. Yes, I'm sure. Um, let's talk structure a little bit. Um, how do you do you do you go into a story thinking i'm gonna i'm gonna change structure do you have a set structure that you like to use or how does that work no set structure I, that was like to me that was kind of a really important piece of it was that each piece trying to figure out what rendered it the best um so you know if you had any set structure in mind ahead of time you're already whittled possibilities down and you're not submitting yourself to the story uh, and that part of that submission is like kind of asking it what best, how do you tell yourself the best? And um, so the way I would go, the way I would think about it, and I'm sure there's a million ways. So anything I say today, just, you know, take it with that grain of salt that um, other people will find their own ways into all this stuff. This just happened to work for me was that I would kind of try to see if I could crystallize what I wanted, the, what I thought the piece had to say that mattered in a sentence, two sentences, maybe three at most. And once I could crystallize what the piece had to say that mattered, then, and I could put it in words, then my next thought or question to myself would be, how do I show that rather than say that? How does the reader land what I landed at that I crystallized in that sentence or two by the end of the piece, how do they land there by, but me not saying it, you know, coming out and saying what, what I think is the, this, why this story matters or what this story is about. What's the heart of this story. So again, I'm asking this, what's, what's the heart of this story. What does it have to say that really matters? Can I crystallize in my head? So now I've said it, but now how do I show it rather than say it? So going through that process, that exploration of those questions in my mind, 
would help. It's not, there's no set, you know, that bingo, it emerges, the answer, eureka moment necessarily, but by going through that process, it would help me to figure out where do I want to end up where the reader kind of has a little bit of an aha at the end or very near the end of realization of what this piece was really about. Um, and then how do I start walking in there so that they are part of the exploration. So part of that structure question is letting the reader feel like they're in on the expedition because that's what lights up the brain. The brain gets lit up when, um, when the reader feels like they're part of the journey and they're making realizations and discoveries. So if you can start moving them in section after section, if you're starting to think of it in your piece in longer pieces, you start thinking in sections that how this each section starts to move, walk the reader on this journey, but doesn't give so much to the reader, so much information or ever say it so much that the reader doesn't feel like that they're a co-partner on this journey, on this expedition. So those are just the kind of things I'm challenging myself or I'm asking myself, am I doing that here that help keep me on you know, firmer ground as I move through a story and, and come up with the structure? Because it's another way to look at it is like you're peeling an onion and you want to get that reader to the end at that, you know, the central or kernel part of that onion and how do you, what layers? So you might, in the early, very beginning in a magazine piece, you're likely gonna to have to give the, the reader a whiff of where this is going so that they're invested enough to like put in the time. So you wanna, you know, give a smell of where this is going, but not pin it down too much. Cause again, you've robbed the reader of, of the journey. So those are the fine line things you're balancing and counterbalancing of like give them enough and, you know, there'd be often from editors a push to put the bullet, you know, the bulletin board graph there that just says what the piece is by the fourth or fifth paragraph or whatever. So that would be a battle between me and editors of not going too far with that because you've just stolen the journey. So, but enough that the reader says, you know, is on firm enough ground to feel like they're going to put in their time. So you tickle their sense of that and give them enough, but you don't go too far and then now you hopefully have them hooked to start this trip with you. And then as you go along, you're always, you know, just that dialogue in your head of, did this go too far? Was there a way to show this and not say it? So the reader has more of the aha and um, keeps going with you. And that each new section might surprise them either through the different kind of wording that gives a, a fresh energy um, or different window in that they weren't expecting suddenly you're coming from so that there you just revive you continually providing new energy somehow through through wording or idea that comes into the piece and you're moving them further along and i wouldn't do an outline although a strong argument could be made for an outline i just didn't do them i would just kind of think it out and you know and you know, there are times when you have to go back and realize, hey, I gave away too much of the goods too early, or there's another vantage point through which to look at this that would have just added a level of intrigue to it that I didn't get. So now I got to go back and patch or do something. But just, you know, these are just some ideas that give you an idea of what was going on internally as I'm making decisions, you know, and creating structure and moving the piece along. In at least in you know my backgrounds, television, sports, or TV news, and the saying there is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. You're saying kind of hint at what you're going to tell them. Eventually get there, whether it's right at the end or right before. I think I read a story a few years ago. Um, Wright Thompson called it the hammer or the surprise at the end. Always keep that hammer there. Uh, and, and then with wording, as you say, you have to somehow bring your style to it. Uh, yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, you, you, first of all, for me, it's like finding the, the, what is the beating heart of the story for you. It's not for the editor. It's not for, you know, you feel like you're being the good boy or good girl, you know, 
touching all the bases that you think your editor wants. So that, that kills the life of a piece. I mean, yeah, for me, it's really important, especially if you're doing longer form narrative, to find what fascinates you in this piece. And then you're, that's the trail you head off and you do it, you know, authoritatively enough and with enough backing with your, your interviewing and research that, that you justify its existence yourself. And uh, you take the reader on a journey that they didn't even necessarily, they wanted to go on or that the editor didn't know. The editor gave you an idea maybe, or it could have been your story idea or the editor's, but you're not like, trying to satisfy what you think the editor wants. You are finding what fascinates you in the piece and going on that journey full heartedly. And um, that those are the best pieces because you are engaged and invested in, in exploring some aspect of human nature or dynamics in the world. Um, and so, you know, that's where you're doing your own reading on the side really matters because the ideas are just there's just a ferment that's going on it you know you're interested in human beings and you're learning more about them and question throwing questions at yourself and at the world and then your pieces start being exemplars of they, they start becoming there you're using you not using people but you're you're exploring these ideas through human specific human beings and being as true to them and you know as you can be in his understanding of their human plight as you can be, but you're also exploring an idea. So a piece has an axis around an idea uh, that matters. Um, and so, yeah, so each piece, even though it's anchored in specificity and a specific human being, but there's an idea that you're exploring about, about life and being alive on this planet and being alive in, in these systems that we're all involved in, which creates all kind of paradox, ambiguity, conflict. Um, but, you know, that's why I think it's very challenging and important for long form writers to be traveling, thinking, reading, writing, and then their pieces will start to become life forms that, you know, play out these questions that, you know, you, that are arising in your mind about who we are and what we are. And very important for you from, from reading your stuff over the years that you, I always felt like I knew the subject or as if I knew the subject better than maybe the subject knew him or herself. Um, important to, here's the whole person, not just a Hollywood washed glamour parts of the people, which I guess would humanize that person, correct? Yeah, I thought that was the only fair way to do it. And, and um, that, you know, if you weren't, and that also is what connects the reader with, with people that could be in the most, you know, whatever highest stratospheres of, of accomplishment or achievement, whether it's in sports or, you know, I did other pieces too sometimes, you know, politics or whatever, um, that um, you're finding the, the terrain that we all share of, of humanity, you know, your dreams, your fears, all that stuff. And that that's, that's the fairest way because it, that's now you're the re readers relating with a human being and that, and the readers way likelier to have understanding for that human being because you're talking in that soil, the soil we all live in. And um, if you just, you're almost hanging them out to dry if you're keeping them as a, as a celebrity on some other level from us, um, um, you know, chances are you're going to end up in the terrain of just cleverness and either bashing or, you know, or uplifting if you're working in that terrain. But in the soil mm -hmm. of humanity where it's all, it's a, if you, you know, are bringing to it the spirit of understanding and wanting to learn yourself through the piece, because each piece I would approach like a short story, like I want to learn about this aspect of humanity and, uh, and so it's like, a sh to me, it was like, I would think of it as a short story um, that I was almost writing fiction, but, uh, you know, with a very stringent, you know, of standards of having to meet the journalistic standards of not, you know, writing bullshit or not making up stuff, but that, you know, was dealing with the, the stuff of humanity that, that fiction writers deal with generally. And so, um, <clears throat> 
but ultimately that would be the fairest because you're like in this consenting adult relationship with someone else and they're to, they're in a risky position putting their life in your hands so if you're not doing it in a way that's really understanding of us and what we face and the challenges and the choice and trade-off of life you get one thing by making it coming to a coping stance with life and other human beings but you give away something usually there's exploring those opposites of what's given up by being a certain way is there's that's really fertile terrain that i would <clears throat> very much encourage anybody who's doing this to look into just think about whatever the character has does it's a strength often not always but often has a flip side to it and look there because that's where the goods are often but it, look there with understanding of where we all are in this plight of life. Once you take form, you, anything you do or do well has a, you're giving away something. Usually there's something you're not because you are something. And um, oftentimes it would turn out that human beings were great at something because of what they were shying away from or steering away from. It was a vulnerability. And the exploration of that vulnerability was really important in understanding why there was this incredible achievement or whatever it was on the other side of that coin. Um, and if it was done fairly, the person themselves would, would often, not always, but often, you know, find value in that. In the interviewing process itself, because it'd be things that they hadn't often sometimes thought about in the writing of it, you know, and even in the exposition of it, um, not every character, but a number of them were, uh, you know, it seemed like they, they got something out of that journey too. Uh, so anyway. I want to ask you about, and I'm sure you've asked, been asked a zillion times, what's your favorite story or what are your top five? Um, I just reread because it was maybe my favorite story of yours, the Tom Mackey Floyd Little uh, story. Where, where did, do you remember where the, idea for that story came from? There's been a couple stories that just fall serendipitously into your lap and that was one of them um, that uh, Tom, you know, I think as part of his uh, drive to get Floyd Little elected to the Hall of Fame, you know, he'd read, I guess, some of my stuff and just, you know, just pulled that lever, sends me a letter and says, I think there's a story about Floyd Little in the Hall of Fame and gave me just enough about his own part in it that I found really fascinating of like some little, you know, unknown person who becomes obsessed with getting a star into the hall of fame. And just that relationship that evolves between a star and an unknown person in this endeavor to get him in the hall of fame. And that was in intrigued me that dynamic. And so off I went. And so for that story, how much time would you spend interviewing? Typically, you know, I would either first, my first step, even before deciding a story, because when you're doing four stories a year and as you go on, it became really critical to have pieces that I found something that fascinated me. And if it didn't, just it, it would be crazy when you got four bullets to fire to fire one of them on or two of them on something that's kind of a good story, but doesn't really have the legs to go 8,000 words. So I would spend, you know, sometimes a week researching something before and sometimes deciding, no, I'm not doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, there would be that a week or two weeks, sometimes researching, learning everything about the person I can that's been written. So I'm now I've got an, enough idea to start spinning some thoughts, but not coming to any pre, you know, sentiments that are going to narrow possibilities. It would be an open mind, but... Uh, going in pretend without judging but um, what the story is going to be because so many times it ended up being so different than I ever would have imagined walking in but you know spend that time reading learning everything about the person but some people were in situations or in their expertise was in something I didn't know their world that well so I would you know might spend another week or more reading about that world. If it's a North American Indian from the Plains who comes from that background, a Native American, I'd need to learn that world. So I might read four or five books about that. Um, so, but that those were rare. Usually it wasn't that much time um, spent 
you know, pre-research. Um, but if it was a different world that I didn't know, I would, I would do that. So then, you know, that could be, a, I could have a couple weeks invested at that point. And now I'm walking into the person's life. I might spend a week, a week and a half hanging with them. Of course, they're not going to give me every minute. So it might be a couple hours here one day, a couple hours there. And so that might unfold over seven to 10 days. Then I'd get back, go through all those notes I scribbled while I was face to face with that person and everyone around them. I'd be interviewing everybody in their life that I possibly could during that week to, to two weeks there. And as I transcribed those notes into my laptop, having a notepad and pen at the ready to ask questions that start emerging as you're going over your material was really critical. Um, I would <clears throat> just, things emerge as you're going over the material, like, ha, ah, that's a telling moment that I wasn't, you know, totally on top of while I was there. So a lot of backup phone calling now would occur to the main character or other characters so that I could write that moment as if I was there. Um, because that was the thing, main thing I found. So much of magazine journalism, you, could, you feel the strain of the reporter or the writer trying to make something count that didn't really count that much of their interaction with the person. Most people are not gonna be that revealing in the time you're with them that you're gonna get those pivotal insight moments from something that was happened right in front of your eyes between you and that person but you've all read those pieces where it's like trying to make a mountain out of the molehill of a 45 minute lunch with somebody at a restaurant you know a hotel and you can feel the strain of that in every word of it almost so early on i quickly realized that the pivotal moments the most revealing moments most likely, once in a while I got lucky and they happened right in front of me, but most likely it happened in the past. So now the next question is how do you render those moments? First find out about those moments and then how do you render them almost like a fiction writer would who could invent and create those, the details. So that involves a lot of, you know, legwork of, you know, asking minutia questions about sight, smell, tastes of that moment from a number of vantage points of people who might have been there if it was more than one person there. So all that with, you know, the realization of what those pivotal moments are in a life would emerge sometimes more as you reviewed your material afterwards. So that's when the waves of follow-up phone calling would occur um, to nail those details down, to bring those moments to life. The other thing I would do would be imagine myself in the character's position. And a lot, that's, you know, kind of a, I found that really helpful. Like, I, of course I'm different than that person, but I would imagine myself, if I was in that situation, what are some things that would be going on inside me? What kind of conflicts, what does it bring to bear inside me? And that would spawn ideas for questions that sometimes brought back some really good stuff. So just intuitively and imaginatively putting yourself in the character's position and obviously checking, never surmising a damn thing about that, but it would just create questions that I would ask that sometimes brought some really interesting answers. Um, so that was this, the, you know, the next wave of the whole thing was those follow-up calls. So at the end of that, all those follow-up calls, and then now I've input all that into my laptop. And I would put them in sections that had either um, thematic sections or chronological sections so i'd know where to find that material now that i've got everything and it's time to write so i'd have you know i don't know how many pages it could be 50 to 100 150 pages with headings on them you know into sections so i'd know where to find the material but at that point i have more familiarity just by typing everything in that i had in my notepad um so then, you know, if I've done all that follow-up calling and now it's time to write, then I'd be asking the structure questions that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how the phases of it went for me. But then the other little piece of it is, not little, the big piece that uh, we haven't discussed is where to set up the camera. Like I would try to think of these things in cinema, cinematographic, you know, cinematic terms or like, where is this story best told from? If it was a room and you picture where you set the camera up, that can make all the difference in the world about this story and how you, it might best be rendered. 
which means sometimes it's going to be told through another uh, one particular character. These maybe not even your main character. Like it would just occur to me at some point, this is an interesting story. Just maybe told from the ubiquitous, you know, narrative voice. But is it a better story? Is told through the eyes of one person in that person's life. So posing that question to yourself can really sometimes really pay off. They really paid off for me. One example is a story about Pat Summit, where she's just, again, that hyper intense coach who's kind of a type, an archetype. And I'd written that archetype in the past. And it just occurred to me that her embodiment on the court is a point guard. And, you know, I just got a couple good anecdotes about. Um, uh, Michelle Marciniak, a point guard at University of Tennessee, who'd had some, a couple of interesting, some in her years with Pat, had, had a, some interesting moments. So that's just in my material. It's, I'm figuring, oh, they'll just, Michelle will be, a, she'll crop up a couple of times in this story for some telling moments about Pat Summit. But is this going to be, at first, I'm thinking the, you know, typical Pat Summit story told from a, you know, third person, all seeing narrative voice. But then it occurs to me, like, this is actually a way more interesting story if it's told through the flesh, blood, and tears of, of Michelle Marciniak, of her experience in Pat Summit. So now all that information I've got about Pat Summit has to somehow be strained through the, the life, the blood, the tissue of Michelle. So now is it, I'm about to write a story about Pat Summit. Now I, so I fly up to, to Michelle's, where she is, and decide is that, you know, so I have to bounce everything that I want to say or think is important about Pat off of her to get her take on it. But that, that doing that meant the world to that piece. Um, because now you go through this voyage of this character who's kind of at the mercy of Pat Summit. She's Pat Summit's pawn, but Pat Summit is, needs her because she's Pat Summit on the court controls the whole, you know, team basically as the point guard. But the the boot camp and the mental excruciate, you know, what she's gonna have to go through to be worthy of Pat, what Pat's gonna put her through. Just everything that you wanna say about Pat in a piece like that, now you have an investment that you're tied to this character who's experiencing Pat in the most, you know, hottest, tensest, you know, form possible. So suddenly that piece takes on a life because you move the camera and do it all through her. And that, you know, it's, it's, there's extra work there for sure because you, you can't just have anything extraneous that you're saying about Pat that hasn't come through Michelle and you're getting Michelle's kind of take on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's an interesting proposition, but it really has, there's great, you know, gold to be mined by thinking that way. Where am I putting the camera in this piece? Where is it best told from which vantage point? All right, let me open it up for questions. If you have a question, either please uh, throw it in chat or hit your hand raise icon, David Hale. First one in, go David. Hey, I'd like to be first. That, that way I can set a low <laughs> bar for everybody else. Um, I, I had a, a, a small aside for Gary. I, I, the first time I met Gary was uh, he was in Philadelphia doing a series of stories on the Phillies uh, when they had uh, a tremendous pitching staff that included uh, Cliff Lee and Roy Halladay and Roy Oswalt and Cole Hamels. And he would wrote, wrote a, wrote a great, great piece on, on Carlos Ruiz, who was the catcher. And the first line in the piece uh, refers to all the media in the room as locusts with microphones. And I remember thinking at the time, boy, that's harsh. And uh, I actually was walking outside the other day. And of course, there's a million cicadas and whatnot out in North Carolina right now that it's deafening. And I was like, Hey, I get that. That was that's actually a pretty damn good analogy for what we're like in the locker room. So <laughs> anyway, you're I, I belatedly forgive you for calling us all locusts now, Gary. Hey, I was um, I was one of the locusts. I'm <laughs> right there. And is it cicada or cicada? I've always I've been wondering about that, David. Can you confirm? I, I I'm a Philly guy, and we call them cicadas. I don't know. I hear different everywhere. So. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you, I know there's, you know, people will talk about the uh, amazing lengths that you go to in reporting, but I remember when you were inducted into the Hall of Fame uh, there for, uh, in, uh, I guess, was it in Winston-Salem that we had that ceremony? Salisbury. Uh, Dave? That was Salisbury. Salisbury, yeah. But uh, you told a great story about a, uh, a trip to Italy that you took 
uh, at a very difficult time in your life that I think at the end you did a wonderful job of tying back to how you go about doing reporting and following a story as far as it can go. And I was wondering if you would be kind enough to reshare that story here. Um, so the, the main idea there was following a thread. And, uh, and sometimes that thread can be an utterly whimsical thread. And it was just a matter of, uh, you know, I just finished up on a story that landed me in Rome. You know, I did not um, had time on my side at that point and uh, just jumped on a train in Rome and didn't and purposefully didn't ask where it was going. Just asked when's the next train and followed it to its final stop. Had no idea where I was, got off. And, you know, then it determined to continue this kind of uh, the whimsy of uh, just finding the nearest bus station and then get on the first bus. Don't ask where it's gone. Just whatever the next bus was going, I'm getting on and did that. And then uh, took that to the end and, you know, decided to, to further add another dimension to that. Just putting my thumb out there as soon as I walked out of that bus, which I did in a vehicle, you know, came up with an old battered small red car with a crazy man driving it long wild black hair and shining wild black eyes and just uh he happened to pull up with uh psycho killer playing which is the song i played <laughs> was strummed on the guitar um and so uh he t uh, he says where are you going i said you know and the, we don't speak each other's language this is all through hand signals uh, i'm going where you're going is basically what i keep saying like yeah i'm going with you and he, he was shaking his head and but crazy enough to go with it and so we uh, throbbed our way to his little village, um, which is about a half hour away, with Psycho Killer playing repeatedly, incredible <laughs> decibels all the way to his village and uh, got off there. And the first thing I find out that everybody calls him Psycho Killer because that he loves this song so much that they, that's the, in Italian, that's what they call him, Psycho Killer. And we spent a day in a bar it became the village's problem of where to put the American because there was no hotels or bed and breakfasts or Airbnbs in this town. It's so small and it's back in the 80s and uh, just serendipity just ensued on and on one layer after another from that relationship and uh, became a lifelong recurring thing. But anyway, that was it was kind of just like, you know, the idea of, I'm trying to think of the tie and why this even matters, but uh, bringing that spirit to your journalism or now, you know, your writing, I think is, is important. And if you can nurture that side of yourself, it's really important is all I'll say. All right, thank you. Chapel Fowler, if you would go ahead and unmute and ask your hey, question. Gary, thanks for doing this. Uh, longtime fan. Um, oh, thank you. Whenever you're, let's say you're a beat reporter for insert high school area or college team or pro team, how do you kind of, how would you approach long form writing where obviously you don't have time to, you know, just write four super long stories every year, but maybe you can work in like one 1500 to 2000 every few months. What, what do you have tips yeah. like there? Well, it was just, you know, I, that's, I, I, I totally, uh, that's the caveat or the provisor one. I, talk about this this way. I know that most people I'm talking to aren't fortunate enough to have that kind of time and space. So it's always like half cringing, almost unfair, you know, to even throw some of this stuff out. But it informs your mentality, I think, when you start thinking this way and you have to accept the limits and the ceilings that are on you because you just don't have the time and space. Totally understood. But I think you start developing a mind that's pushing the envelope to go back to another bad cliche again, but um, that that's important to start developing that kind of mind, even when you're confined to 750 words or a midnight deadline tonight. Um, so, you know, when I was at the Daily News, I started thinking that way. And so, for example, covering the Eagles, I would just, back at that time, the star running back was Wilbert Montgomery, and it would just be like, as soon as I was done getting the, the material I needed to do the beat for the day and write my story, I'd be like just talking to him and getting his life story and just spending an extra hour or whatever over a number of days. 
and then go to the editor and say, look, I think I, you know, I got, you could do a real takeout piece on Wilbur Montgomery. Could you clear out a couple days on the beat for me? And so, you know, they, that again, because of the spirit of the daily news at that time, that, that, that could happen. Um, and so that's what I started doing. And so, you know, just the, if you're thinking that way, the, the trail will start to pull you that way. Um, so I, you, you have to accept, and it's been a lot of frustrating aspects of this at that point in your life that you can't do some of those things, but just the spirit starts to create some of the opportunities that will end up paying off down the road. And I know Mike has done it big time at the Daily News, uh, found a way to write some great long form pieces, even though he's got you know a regular column to write. And um, so it can be done. It's challenging as hell. But um, I think it really matters. And, uh, and you just uh, you, the way you, the questions you ask, if you're thinking in this spirit, will start to change. And you'll start to be asked about human stuff that, um, that again, hopefully you can find a way to get this, to do a little longer piece, a little longer. Um, so it, it's not a totally satisfying answer, but it's, um, and it just, you start moving away from, the shorter piece kind of inherently calls for cleverness, but the longer piece cleverness works against you. So it's really important to start to develop this other muscle and you don't need to give up the clever muscle. It's good, it's cool, it's fun. It's good, clean fun, you know, if it's not done in a too, a too rough of a spirit and you're always realizing you're working with another human being here, it's their life and it's on the at play but that cleverness in, in long form writing just starts subtracting. And so it's important to start developing this other side, this spirit of exploration and understanding and non-judgment, but you know, deep drill spirit. That's great, thank you. Sure. Before mentioned, Mike Sielski is next, Michael. Um, first things first, Gary, thank you. That was very kind of you to say. Um, I should point out for the rest of the group, Gary and I are both alumni of the same university. Uh, I'm a Philly guy too, LaSalle University, and there's something very, very sobering and humbling knowing that you could win 12 Pulitzer Prizes <laughs> and you will still never be any better than the second best sports writer to come out of your alma mater. That kind of stinks. Um, so, Gary, my question for you is, and, and you and I have kind of kicked this around before, um, uh, your take on long form in today's age of media, um, you know, within the last couple of months, you've seen some, we've all seen some, some media outlets that have cut back on the kind of in-depth reporting. I think that we all really appreciate, uh, at least those of us on the call. Um, and at least in my experience, it seems at both at the Inquirer and Daily News and at other places that when, that, when it's done right, that sort of journalism and reporting really does attract an audience. And I guess I'm curious about your thoughts on the future of, of what we're all talking about here, because even though it seems like readers might value it and sports fans might value it and people who like to read <laughs> in-depth things might value it, um, the perception is that it's not valued in our society today. Yeah, it was, it was striking to me how many times this conversation came up, as, even as, you know, especially in the final you know, seven or eight years I wrote at SI, um, just the, the, the two forces that play with each other, but how many times editors, whose tendency often was sometimes to argue for the side of shorter, you know, quick hit things, but they would finally have to admit over and over and over again that the by far biggest reader response they got was on these kind of pieces. So it would undo, it would dismantle their own arguments of why you need to write shorter or give us a quicker take on this, that, or the other. And the number of times that that admission finally came true, just, you know, made you really know in your heart that they know that, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive, but that you can get the reader to engage on long form. And then another example, example of that is what's happening unfortunately in my town here in Charleston. The Charleston Post and Courier by all purposes should have been 
closed up or, you know, just a limping little shell of itself by this point, because that's happened in newspaper after newspaper. They put their eggs in the basket of long investigative pieces, human interest stories, and they'll pop these a couple times a week. And the, the paper is, I don't know, flourishing is too strong of a word, but it's doing way better than most of its compatriots. And it's um, a writer who happens to live across the street from me named Tony, Tony Bartlemé is one of their, one of a cadre of writers who they give time and space to write this long form stuff. And they get, they've gotten, and he's told me like that's the same conversation is occurring and they, they pretty much realized the leadership of this newspaper that this is what cements a relationship with their readers way more than anything else. And they put their money in that basket and it's paying off for them. But they go deep dive on these stories that matter. And it could be environmental stories, human stories that emerged out of um, the, the, the murder of nine people at the um, African Methodist Church here in Charleston, you name it, across the board. They've done that and it's, it's why they're surviving and, and doing really doing well. Um, so if you can get the facts or get you know, editors at your paper to talk to people who, where they've made that decision, there's the argument is this, it's got some real footing to be made. I don't know if I answered your question all the way. Is there another window into it that you were thinking about more or is that kind of where you were going there? No, that's pretty much it. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, as I said, that um, th these pieces and, and this kind of journalism are, have somehow become underrated. It used to become be much more of the norm, not, not to the extent that you did it, eight, 9,000 words necessarily, but um, the idea that people want to read to me seems to be um, undersold nowadays. Yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah, and, and, and I mean, today you might, maybe the way you sell it is like, besides writing a long piece, now I can do a podcast about it or something that, you know, delivers it on a second platform, you know, and that wouldn't be my game. But if I was forced that way, they gave me the chance to write at that depth. And then, you know, maybe that spawns three pieces of a podcast that, because I know people have connected with some of those deep dives on podcasts um, series. So maybe that's a way to sell it that it would light up the brain of the bean counters, you know, at your, your company. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, I would be thinking out of the box like that to find a way to convince them to let me do this kind of valuable journalism. Bethany, go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Gary, for being here so much. Um, can you hey. hear me okay? Yes. A little low. I'm using low. A little low. I'm going to take I'm going to Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, I am an author, so I find that I put a ton of pressure on myself when it comes to choosing a story. I liked what you said about taking a week to research and review whether something's worth telling. I think because of the amount of time it takes me to research and write and market a book, I sometimes get paralyzed by whether this idea is worthy of that investment. And, and I'm, you know, I'm a freelancer, so I'm not, I don't often have other people Yes. Yeah. Nay nay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm always looking for untold or undertold stories in sports, and and that's still my number one kind of holy grail. But I wanted to, and you know, kind of hear what you would say also about stories that have been told, because certainly someone else had written about Pat Summit before you did it. Um, there have been, you know, how many books have been written about, you know, Michael Jordan or someone like that. But but how do how do you decide whether a story that maybe has been told but should be tackled from a different angle or should be um you know tackled again for for a compelling reason yeah um that's there's no clean answer to that obviously if it was it would make that a lot easier decision i i feel your pain it can be excruciating deciding whether to commit to something all the way um my biggest answer on that would again be if you're fascinated and it it may not pay off i'm not there's no guarantees in any of this but if you the odds are way higher on your side if it's something you are really intrigued by and something but that that won't answer your question 
with finality, I know so you could be really interested in something, you still be, yes, but do I stake my life on it, basically? Um, but that's number one. Does this fascinate me? Is there an aspect of this that fascinates me? Um, will it be fun? Well, you know, hey, there's another question I'm throwing into the mix. Um, is the person I'm going to be spending a lot of time with to do this story? Is, is that feel like it could be an interesting relationship. You know, sometimes these develop into life relationships, not just story relationships. Um, is, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I wish I had a clean answer on that one. It's, it's just like, it's, do I have something valuable to say about this? Or do I think there might be something valuable to say is there a doorway into it that it doesn't feel like it's been overdone? And then some of it's just trust and belief in yourself. Like, I feel like when I'm engaged in this, you know, something will emerge. It won't be what's already been done. That, you know, I just, you know, trust that I think in a way or will ask the kinds of questions that will get to maybe a more human level of this because that's usually the end is what's missing in a piece is the depth of its humanity and if you you know the more you're engaged in that on your own in life in your relationships with other people in your relationship with books travel you name it that you trust that there's a well enough there that you'll be your mind will engage in it in a way then there's a real good chance you are it is going to be worth it because you are going to, you know, find that humanity. It's probably going to take it somewhere that others haven't, unless it's just an exhausted, some of the best writers have already been there and done it. That would give me some real pause. But uh, otherwise, if I'm fascinated, I'm going to trust myself that it's going to be special enough and uh, that I'll spend enough time that even if my first take on it seems somewhat ordinary that I'll send it around the, you know, around the track enough times um, that I'm, I'll come up with a, w a way of looking at this or a window into it that will be different. Um, the movement of the camera to re repeat something I already said that will tell the story in a way it hasn't been told. Or, so that's just confidence or whatever, you know, trust. Thank you. Sure. It's a hard one. I guess I had to unmute first. My bad. Uh, from the city named after my favorite movie, Jeff Kolpak, Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, thanks for doing this, Gary. Uh, I cover college football, and all interviews now are um, on Zoom. And I wow. feel like you lose, you, you lose the ability to read a person, you lose the emotion of it all. I mean, can you imagine doing the Pat Tillman story by Zoom? Um, I don't know if there's any magic answer, but just curious to what your comments are to that. Um, you know, it would be, I'd be, knowing myself, I'd probably be, um, well, you know, are you talking about Zoom where you're in a group Zoom or an one-on-one -on -one Zoom? one-on-one uh, -on -one. I mean okay. at least that's a little better yeah it is and you know I it, countless gold has come through phone calls it's it, conversations with somebody but, you know often this was after you'd had face-to-face -to -face developed a relationship but um, some really good stuff you know came on the phone so you know don't dismiss it at all but um, yeah um, I would just you know one thing, you know, I don't have a lot to say about that because there's just limitations, you know, to it and we all understand what they are. But um, a lot of writers and reporters have limited themselves and it's, it has to do with their relationship and their own skin with themselves. They, uh, we feel like we're putting people out by spending time and asking them questions. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen it happen and how many times I've felt that energy even come up in myself and had to work with it. But it's critical not to feel like you're putting the person out and that the more time you ask of them that you're in a deficit mode and, you're, and you're, you start to, you take yourself out of the possibility of a piece because you're so worried about 
that you're putting the other person out. And that's a part of human nature, I think, is almost inherent in the spirit of a person who becomes a reporter, is they're concerned about other people. There's a lot of empathy often. And so, um, you know, it, so just, uh, just how many times I even felt that inclination or I've seen it in other reporters where they just say, oh, Joe, just one more question. Do you mind if I, that kind of spirit really hurts you, I think. Um, trusting that the person feels like you're in this for A, you're not going to be judgmental and B, you're really interested in humanity and their life in particular. Um, then, you know, just when they, even if they voice like, oh, this is taking more time than I thought, um, just saying, yes, it, 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 this takes a long time. And, even, you know, and even may, walking into it saying, this may take a little more time, but I like to do pieces that really get to gutsy, to stuff that matters. And to understand you as well as I can, it's going to take some time. So the more you can come in up front, so it's not a surprise that way, but they, the, the person, the subject understands what you're, what you're going for is helpful. And, um, if it's a person you can tell, just, you know, say it's Ben Simmons, he wants to give you five minutes, you know, that's challenging. I get that. But hopefully just in the time you have with them, they, you can establish some sense that, that you're going for something more and you want to understand them. And the best way you can understand them and write the fairest possible story is to get into their shoes and walk and feel what it feels like, what, their life or their, what they're facing. And that, you know, I can be fair and fair, I can be more fair and as, you know, understanding as I can be without, you're not gonna write, you know, soft soaps, any, anything by any means, it doesn't mean that. But the, the, I can be, is render this story in the most understanding way, the more time I can learn about you and who you are and what you faced in life. Um, and so, Establishing that, reminding it, ringing that bell again when if it feels like the person's, you know, got one foot out, you know, reminding of that in a cheerful way um, has gotten me a lot more extra yards, a lot more rope time and not going in that defensive posture or attitude of like, oh, I know this is taking too long. I'm sorry. Can I just ask one more question? All that stuff, so much more is, was gained by letting that feeling of that come up and pass and not giving into it. And uh, so that's something that will be felt hopefully by your subjects. Not always. I, I get there's no, you know, a lot of them are just going to five minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. That's it. But enough of them have gotten a feel for that and went with it, that it was really valuable. So I'm not answering your question per se about the Zoom. But I, I think it informs that and, you know, just that calling extra and whether it's on Zoom or in the phone call and getting that extra time to get that depth is still possible if the subject feels that that's your motivation. Those motivations are clean motivations. And you have to d demonstrate that in the stories you write, you'll get a track record that it develops. And if you don't, you know, live true to that, they'll see it in writing and well, you know, you're not going to be likely to get that time once they, if people have bothered to look at what, what you write and what kind of stuff you do. So it's a two way street there. But if that's all done, you know, with, from with the proper spirit, you will often get way more time with a person because once people get engaged, they want to figure themselves out too. And they get engaged in this expedition that I've referred to. Um, and they appreciate it's someone's trying to do, and that's another thing I've used, like as good as you are at what you do, that's how good I'm trying to be at what I do. And as you know, it takes time. And for me to do this story in a way that's fair to you and it's, this whole engagement is gonna be worthwhile for both of us, it takes time. So I really appreciate you giving me this extra time to, to explore this further in this follow-up call, this follow-up Zoom or whatever the hell it is. So. I hope that some way answers some of that. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. 
Uh, so Gary, are you engaged enough because the non-defensive empathetic me wants to ask if you have time for three I more questions. I knew exactly <laughs> where this was going. As I was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're good. We're good. Yeah. Uh, Ethan Joyce. Hey Gary. Um, hey, Ethan, how are you? I'm good. Um, you know, you're hitting on the, the emotional connections a lot and the ability to you know, empathize and sympathize a lot. And I'm just curious, you know, after you've written a story, what is it like for you as far as keeping contact with either subjects or, or sources um, and maybe kind of how you maintain or even if those relationships stay intact after you've spent this, this time with these people and have learned so much about their lives? Uh, yeah, and that's, I'm going to give you a boring answer, but it's like sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's been rewarding the times it has happened. Um, and it sometimes has a little lifespan of its own. It's like when you travel and meet people and you might, you know, for a year or two stay in touch with them and it might just, do, you know, die off after that. So there's a whole spectrum of answers, but sometimes it has happened and it's been interesting but that can never be your purpose you know as you go into this this trip with a person but yeah i mean i and i don't know if there's an aspect of this that you're looking for that 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 pretty blah answer didn't uh, satisfy but if there is say so now i guess i was just curious and it may be even more difficult in you know writing the big feature pieces as opposed to kind of meeting that subject as a newspaper reporter where you're probably going to keep going back to them as their their story continues to evolve as well but i i guess i was kind of getting at just the relationship but also you know, maybe if that ever led to kind of reconsidering someone's story or maybe realizing it was time to try to write another installment or things like that you know i wasn't an installment kind of guy you know and it, it kind of works against me. Even the idea of writing a book about that somebody had already written a magazine story of, the, the opportunity for that came up many times. And I just, the whole ferment of what I went through approaching it like a, a long, short story to begin with meant that I didn't want to necessarily spend another year expanding what I just spent three months thinking about, you know, almost every waking moment and sometimes sleeping moments and then compressing it down into 9,000 words. And now I'm going to just take bellows and start inflating it out. So anyway, the idea of like revisiting a piece, there were many times, it was time, obviously I went back and did a couple stories about Muhammad Ali, but it was on new pieces or new, whole new things. Uh, so it happened a time or two, but it, I, I wasn't thinking that way. And I wasn't interested in revisiting pieces. Um, I was trying to say enough that you would capture enough that even if there were further developments in somebody's life, that somehow there was an understanding that you would get out of what the original piece was, it would, that it would fit somehow in that whole. Um, so anyway, um, I was never thinking about what's down the road or how this will affect the relationship down the road. It was just a spirit of being fair and honest to the person but yet not being easy, you know, either. Um, so anyway, I don't know if I'm still answering that question, but uh, that's how it felt on this end. Yeah, appreciate it, Gary. Sure. I'm Shanahan, go ahead. Hi, Dave, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, great. Uh, hey, Gary, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, the Tiger Woods story you wrote where you quoted his dad talking about Gandhi um, I was back in San Diego writing at the Union Tribune when T Tiger was just a kid. We covered the uh, Junior World quite extensively. Uh, and I could tell then that the kid <laughs> was a little brat and uh, that his dad was kind of a little bit uh, wacko. But, you know, how are you going to put that in a 12-inch story? Uh, but my point is uh, everything you ever read about Tiger Woods after that was what a great guy he was. And I was wondering how you came to the portrayal you gave about him and how you made that work, because you were so much different than anything else that was being written about him at the time. Great, Tom. Good to see your face, too, because I've seen your byline a number of times. Uh, um, so anyway, yeah, uh, Tiger Woods, as at that point, he was like 21, or I don't know how old he was. He had just busted on the scene, and um, wasn't that interesting of a character to be honest with you himself and I would have been hamster in bad shape if 
I was, it, it was SI had chosen him as the sportsman of the year and asked me to do the long piece on him. And he had just emerged on the professional scene. And so I would have been screwed if, if it was just him because he was, you know, giving me, you know, half an hour in the way to, you know, some golf course to talk or he's watching Sports Center while I'm asking him questions and, you know, just wasn't that engaged or interested in this whole deep dive that I wanted to go on. But his father, you know, was this larger than life character who, you know, was had this vision of his son as not just being a great golfer, but being this epic world changing figure. And so it just, to me, this, this story then moves to how does this kid possibly handle this burden in a way of a father having this vision for him. Um, and so this, this the question, you know, fathers and athletes are often either non-existent or they're just eclipsed by their sons. And so this whole dynamic of what happens when a father of someone who's going for greatness moves the bar to this whole other place that this is you, this son of theirs isn't just going to dominate their sport, but is now to be a person who changes the course of humanity and becomes a bridge, this epic bridge between different races and tribes and ethnicities and religions and puts it into Gandhi, Mandela, you know, into that realm. So now that to me is a fascinating question. And, and now, you know, at that point, the machinery of celebrity was really coming into, to be a machine at that time. It was in the nineties when, you know, we're not, weren't at where we are right now, but yet we were already the signs that were clearly there of what celebrity does to human beings. So how can this child or a very young man enter into this, you know, this maw, M-A-W, of a world where celebrity grinds people down, and yet what the father's calling for is going to call for a humanity to be preserved walking into this, to, to affect, have the effect that the father saw for him would require that very personal ability to preserve your vulnerability and your humanity because you're not going to affect people if you're just this dominating athlete in that way. It just, it just doesn't happen. You have to be a very special human being to even come anywhere near to what the father was calling for. So just that now created a conflict and every story revolves around conflict that, that you know, who's going to win this? What is this going to do psychologically to this kid having this, mantle laid upon him by a father and it was so unusual because fathers just don't do this to great athletes uh, again to repeat they're either eclipsed or they're non-existent and part of the fuel that drives the athlete is the lack of a father or they're just fathers watching in awe of their children who's gone way beyond them so it created the, the, the dilemma around which the story could now revolve it became for me the fascinating and life-saving part of that story because I was screwed as I was saying it was just Tiger and so that became you know again you walk into a story you have no, I wouldn't have dreamt in a million years because the father just happened on my very first night which was a banquet to say this vision for his son and unveiled that vision in a public forum really for the first time he may have given tiny pieces of that out but it never had been declared like that and the father basically said at this sports banquet, I give you my son, treat him gingerly because this son is about to change the course of the world. And so I could have just taken an approach of like, oh yeah, sure, you know, you're full of shit, you know. But again, that would have just crushed what the life possibility was in that story to just be this sneering journalist, you know, just puncturing the narcissist instead it became now this kid now has to work under this this kid now has to deal with this a son of a father that can't just be dismissed that's in his head and in his soul now that so there's something going to play out now and who knows what it, where it's going to go psychologically for this kid but now that that's in the mix 
in a world where celebrity is, you know, runs counter to any, it almost means nobody it, it, it achieved that, what he's talking about would be so difficult for a famous sportsman. But what that's going to do to this kid now becomes the interesting question. And to treat it not in that sneering way, but a, a, a human dilemma now became for me the heart of the story and is why I kind of wrote it the way I did. Yeah, and one of the reasons I asked that question is a lot of the writing, and, re and by the way, I'm glad to know you've seen my byline. Uh, yeah. A lot of the writing uh, that I do is uh, research on about how a lot of the uh, early pioneers of desegregation of college football in the 60s have never gotten their proper credit because they've been overshadowed by these myths about Bear Bryant. Yeah. And just laying out the facts in my book uh, didn't get me anywhere. And, and so maybe now I'm trying to tell more personal stories. Uh, just keep plugging away with that until maybe I can hit a tripwire someday or what? Yeah, I mean, it's the personal story, you know, there'd be so many times when I'd be, have a, an idea of something that was in the air and it'd be, you could write about it from the abstract more, but the way more provocative and powerful way almost always was to tell it through an individual and get to this larger stuff, but through one person's life. It just had way more possibility of sticking to people's ribs and mattering more that way versus just doing it more from the abstract to just writing about an idea or an issue. I found there's so many issues in sports and in our society that you could write about. And it was tempting or was often put on me by editors to do that. But I ultimately, more and more, I would just say, Thank you, but no thank you. If I if, if I can find a way to, to for that idea to be emerge and flower and blossom through an individual story, it had way more possibility. I found. So whether that lands and makes you any money or whatever, I God only knows. But that's where I think uh, you know the the best bet is. Okay, great. Those were both good answers. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And batting cleanup today, David Teal. Hey, David. Greetings, Gary. Thanks for being so generous with your time today. Sure. How, how do you avoid the abyss that traps so many of us of direct quotations and being a slave to transcribing tape and such? Yeah. Um, that's a huge question and an important one. Um, um, early on, I kind of came to the to the place in where I just decided that if it wasn't a quote that really was said in a way better than I could say it, or more interesting, or just showed something about the spirit of the of the subject, I would put these hurdles up that it had to pass in order to appear in my story as a quote. So many reporters, and I get it on the, you know, especially in newspapers, are they're trying to show it's like the good boy, good girl again, showing their editor that they did their legwork and look at these quotes I got. And A, I would say, I'm the writer, I'm being hired. If I can't find a better way to say this than the person, then I shouldn't be in this position. So starting from that premise to begin with, B, does it, if it does express something that's quirky about the person, or said in a, their sense of humor, and then I'll maybe it, it passes a hurdle that it, it might get into the story, or it just has a, a window that's different or something that's said in a different way, then it, and it's possible. But generally speaking, uh, in narrative form, it, it works against you. It's, to me, I, my, the way I always pictured it was like a, being in a, a movie theater. And when you're engrossed in a story, you're in the story and the characters aren't telling you about another story. Like it's not like the equivalent of a quote to me would be like one character in a movie suddenly starts saying, well, you know, Joe here, who's, he's, you know, really an interesting guy and I like him and I go way back with him. And one time this happened between us, you know, that's not what happens. You're seeing the action unveiled and unfold. And that gets the investment to the reader and the connection with the, between the reader and the, or the viewer in the movie, you and that character because you're just watching it unfold. So the narrator's job as the writer is to just drive that action and let what you're learning about the characters is unfolding through action. 
not through somebody telling you. That's the equivalent of you as a writer saying instead of showing. So why am I going to let the, 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 one of the characters who's in my story do that when I'm not even letting myself do that? I've just given away. So, so to me, it was like, again, to go back to the movie theater, the viewer of the movie, a quote was the equivalent of hearing sirens. It's like, oh, I'm in a movie theater. I'm not lost in this story, this movie. I'm now aware that I'm a person sitting in a movie theater. You're, the quotes had that effect. You don't even realize it, but that's what you just did to the reader. Um, so I'm gonna, it's gonna be a high bar for me to run quotes, you know, and maybe sometimes I didn't always, sometimes I let some slip or for some reason, but there was, it needed to be a reason in my mind. Otherwise, the driving narrative locomotive should carry the reader through it and it should, it's a more powerful way than stopping action to have somebody tell you something or to say something. So I know that it's a lesser bar for a short newspaper story than for a longer form narrative. So I get that. And if I was a newspaper writer, I'm sure there'd be times I'd be running some blocks of quotes. So I totally understand that. And, but in the spirit of what the larger thing we're talking about here, that's what, that my, where my answer is coming from. Perfect, thank you. Sure. And with that, I say thank you all for tuning in. Gary Smith, can't thank you enough for your time today and uh, uh, your donations to NSMA as well. So thank you very much. We'll, uh, I'm sure, be in touch. Um, I learned a lot. So Great. anytime thank you learn a lot, I consider that a good day. Great questions and uh, great, good fun talking to everybody. And uh, thank you again. All right, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you to Greater Winston-Salem Inc. for allowing us to be able to do this. Have a great, great. weekend.